All right, so this is the second lecture in this series about integrating um, Aristotle's worldview with Indonesia's Panchasila, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and systems thinking in order to create a sustainable global civilization in as soon as possible. <laughs> okay, so the second lecture is about Aristotle's virtues and specific, specifically the personal and social virtues that are developed from childhood until coming of age, particularly. So, um, let me start out with the a few qualifications. One reason, um, one problem in the project of trying to get academics who are trained in modern Western thinking to change the paradigm is that they don't necessarily understand the importance of raising children to love virtue. Um, and that is because of the way the modern, um, modern view of the psyche was social engineering. You could use social science to engineer children to love, to be virtuous. Whereas in the ancient cultures, they grow up imitating the people around them. So they develop because of their relationships, not because of the well-honed techniques of the social engineers. There might be social engineers that understand that, but it's not the model. The model is that you can engineer people. Whereas the model in ancient culture is that people are social by nature and the, the social interaction that children have, not the beliefs of their parents, but the behaviors and the emotions. What makes their parents happy and what makes them sad? What they take pleasure in, what they don't like. This is what a child will internalize. So, so Aristotle did say, the most important part of childhood education is what, how does how to experience pleasure and pain appropriately. So um, I think academics, the way that the university system is set up is that academics are as far removed from this process as possible. It doesn't, again, it doesn't mean that they aren't particularly aware, but the way the structure is set up is they get jobs. When they apply for jobs, it's anywhere in the country or anywhere in the world. So it's very unlikely that they will be raising their children within the context of an extended family. And that was the way children were raised, evolved until very recently. This is a very unnatural situation. The academics themselves are rewarded for staying in their offices and writing and reading and doing things just at that professional level, not becoming engaged with the community and identifying with and following up on and being connected to um, not only their own families, but until recently, extended family, community, church family, and you'd have this interaction among the generations. There would just be a lot of social interaction that is just really missing in the model of the successful research university professor. Um, so um, the other problem, ancient models were racist, sexist, elitist often. 
And so you have to adapt Aristotle to that. There's no way anybody would be a fundamentalist and um, take Aristotle's student notes. I mean, what we have is Aristotle's works are student notes that have been translated into other languages that were written down, you know, pretty haphazardly in the first place and brought together by somebody who thought one way of putting them together made sense. I mean, they're very imprecise. And Aristotle himself would have changed his mind. He was an empiricist. So if he made a mistake, there's no point in supporting him. He would have changed his mind. So there's that, all those problems. I don't think he would be racist or sexist or elitist in the sense, class-based elitism, there's no way. Um, that, you know, you could quote him. Some of the quotes are flat out sexist. Some of them are, would he still, you know, is that what he meant? Things like that. But anyway, that's a, a problem. And you just have to say, well, this is how I think an Aristotelian. This is how someone who has that sort of perspective. And again, we're moving towards systems thinking. Systems thinkers are not, many of them wouldn't even identify as Aristotelian. It's just that Capra and Luisi and some other ones have noticed that, gee, the model we're going toward is very Aristotelian, but they don't come at that after having read every one of Aristotle's works and studied it, they just noticed the basic concept of flourishing is very Aristotelian, very biological. Um, and that's, they leave it at that. So my contribution is to actually push that further, but not as far as somebody whose PhD was in one a few pages of one of Aristotle's works or something. I'm not going to go that, uh, become that literalist. Okay, so another per reason it's difficult to bring up are it tends to become very class-based right away, that children of in more affluent families where they have safety, security, uh, better education, better health care, they have parents that are home more often. They have more leisure time. They might have more community activities than poor kids who live in poor neighborhoods that are more dangerous. Their parents are gone because they have to work to get food on the table. There's racism. There's, you know, they grow up in more difficult situations. Now, that even isn't even always true. It's a stereotype. It might be a trend, but my son and his wife work in um, inner city neighborhoods. And there's a lot of good going on in those neighborhoods, in the schools especially, that create safe spaces that really know what kids need. It's not the child's fault that they don't have parents that are home as much. Their parents have to worry about money and safety a lot more. So Aristotle would not blame the kid and would not say, gee, these are bad parents. Or that child is not growing up being formed, so they will never be virtuous. Aristotle would not say that. He would say, what's with the wealthy people that they aren't creating a strong and stable middle class? It's their responsibility because they have the privilege to lift people up and give everyone as much opportunity to participate in public life, to rule and be ruled. So the first responsibility, the, the major problem here is not with the bad parents or the bad kids behavior of the poor neighborhoods. It's with the, the haves on the top half of society, not structuring things so that there is this divide. 
Okay, so the way children are raised is critical for our capacity to preserve a stable society. Even in societies with monarchs or groups of aristocrats who inherit power, they can't be stable unless children are raised, taking pleasure in self-control, cooperation, concern for each other. Okay, today, prominent leaders in the neurosciences, like Antonio Damasio, have rejected the Enlightenment model of psychology and have shown through extensive research that, quote, we are wired to cooperate with each other. So if you are the monarch's family, what's the main um, duty of a monarch is to make sure that their children are educated to rule for the sake of the rules. Um, so that when they take over, they also use the power they have to benefit the rules. Same with an aristocracy. If, they, if there's a group of families that have this privilege, then it's their duty to teach their children to use the privilege they have to create a strong and stable middle class and to provide everyone as much opportunity as possible for education, healthcare, engagement, and civic life. So, for example, in the Iliad, that it's a war between a, a Troy was a monarchy and the Achaeans were a federation of city-states. They were an aristocracy. But even then, um, they met the ecclesia, the soldiers would meet, and the leaders would explain to them the decisions that they're making about the city. So Priam, whether he's going to let Helen in, which is a big deal, and then and um, the Achaeans, whether Agamemnon should give back um, his concubine, but and they voted on it. So even though their vote wasn't the last say, I mean, the monarch did make the final decision and the aristocrats made the final decision. You can see that um, it was their responsibility to be transparent and accountable, even though they ultimately had the final say. So you're educating your children to become engaged, informed citizens. Um, and they need to take pleasure in helping each other out. Okay, the virtues are the result of evolution. As our species began to live in more and more complex societies, our brains developed in response to the problems that arose in that community. So, and that complexity. This is Antonio Damasio, a very, very prominent, respected neuroscience, neuroscientist, at least. The book that I engaged with and wrote my own book about was published in 2003. And I can't keep track of people's reputations or whatever, but at that time, he was extremely, um, he had a lot of respect in many different communities from Nobel Prize winners. So this is what he was saying, um, that at a certain point, our brains developed to a higher level and we became aware of our need to live for this, uh, to, under a common body of laws. So we can't actively exercise all of our capacities for flourishing Unless we live together in these complex communities, people are parts of many social networks and they have a common body of laws. We have to figure out how to create a body of laws that is both applied and enforced with the goal of enabling as many people as possible to flourish to the highest level of poss possible for as long as possible. So this is the um, light. This is the goal toward which all of our behavior, all of our childhood habituation should aim. 
Okay, so the goal is the active exercise of all of our natural virtues. Begins with childhood. Children need role models. Character development. So children, if you have a strong character, you want to be virtuous. Um, if children grow up being forced to be virtuous, but not really wanting to, their characters will be wicked. And when they finally get a chance to make their own choices, they will make the wrong choices. So parents really need to examine themselves to see what am I really teaching my children about character. Okay, in every case for Aristotle, the way he defines a virtue is the middle ground between extremes. There's no one rule or principle. It's not like utilitarian principle or Kant's um, unconditional laws, the moral law. It's you and you and it's a dialectical tradition. In order to figure out what the middle middle ground is, you need to talk to yourself, but also talk to other people. So, you know, Fred Flintstone would have an angel over here and a devil over here. And he's talking to himself. But Plato said thought is an inner dialogue of the soul with itself. But it's better if you actually talk to other people. Well, what are the extremes and what's the mean and what, as far as I know, what's the best thing for me to do right now? Okay, we are creatures of culture. The social networks we create form our characters and we need lots of different ones. We need this social approval to survive our relationships go way beyond what the laws can force us to do or prohibit. And so we have to create a quality of life um, based on these social bonds. And you can talk about the social fabric. Is the social fabric, you know, strong or is it being um, threadbare? You know, is it falling? Is it unraveling? We do use these words weaving people together, the unraveling of the social fabric. Um, Athena, the goddess of wisdom and justice, actually, when, we sh when she went home to take a break, she wove clothes for people. So she provided them clothing. She provided them good laws. She provided enforcement application of those laws in a wise, she had practical wisdom. Anyway, in this process, the most, um, the biggest threat to the weaving together of people and having a flourishing society is greed. Um, because it's something everybody understands and everybody in the household is constantly making decisions about what they need and what they want. And natural acquisition is to choose the mean to live in a way that provides your basic needs, but not excess. Unnatural acquisition is greed, the desire for more than your share. What are our basic instinctual drives? The two that are most powerful that we share with the animals, these are animal drives, are pleasure and fear, especially the pleasures in relation to hunger. So we know we need to eat. And when people get really hungry, they can get pretty aggressive um, or die. So, and the best choice, what the best diet is varies uh, from person to person. It varies over time. And you have to make a judgment. There aren't any absolutes, but there are definitely extremes. Um, the goal is to eat the right amount for the right reason in the right way at the right time. And what experts are finding out is that really people need to eat in the context of fellowship. They need conversation with friends. 
in order to actually have a healthy attitude toward food. Um, I will, I have a whole other presentation on food and how our entire global food system has been corrupted by greed. Okay, so what are the types of character in relation to hunger? And this is a pattern for all the virtues. You have a character. You are constitutionally, you tend to want to eat too much. Then you're self-indulgent. If you don't even know what foods are healthy and you don't think there's anything wrong with being obese or with wasting food, that would be self-indulgent. If you're morally weak, you know what's best, but you don't want to do it, and you end up overeating or eating the wrong things, and you have regrets. If you're morally strong, you know what's best, you don't want to do it, but your reason and your knowledge control your behavior. And it's important because you haven't, you're internally conflicted, and so you're wasting a lot of energy preventing yourself from overeating or eating the wrong things. If you're really wise and rational, you know what's best, you take pleasure in eating the right amount, and it gives you a lot of energy because you're not internally conflicting. It gives you integrity. So the goal, the wise person has integrity, which means they're integrated. What they desire, what they do, their way of life is all um, fl promotes flourishing and they know that and they take pleasure in that. Okay, the other instinctual drive is courage, is the virtue in relationship to fear or danger. So we have many physical fears. So we can observe animals. Animals also have these drives. You can tell that they, they are afraid and they behave on fear and they're hungry and they behave on hunger. So, so by definition, what's the definition of, we have physical fears, we have facing danger, including pain, aging, death, death and war and illness. But we also have fears related to culture. And then we study animals, higher order animals, have various degrees of these different fears. Fear of not succeeding in the economic system. Um, I think human societies are a lot more complex. And so human beings can be afraid of not succeeding. And this fear is literally only in their head. <laughs> They've invented it um, because they have some idea about anticipating what their boss thinks or anticipating whether what they do now is going to, there's going to be a market for it in the future. I mean, human beings are capable of really going out of bounds in terms of fears, just like uh, eating. Obesity, there aren't too many obese animals. Um, it's definitely not the norm. Whereas uh, right now in America, 80% of people over age 50 have a metabolic disorder because they're not eating appropriately. And that's because of greed. But we have all these fears related to culture, fear of loss of friends, loss of status, social isolation, um, and animals can have some of that, but I don't think they can have these runaway imaginations where they anticipate the future or they, they can, human beings are capable of really missing the mark. Um, the mark would be the appropriate reaction in a situation. You can be too afraid, that's cowardice, or not afraid enough. You're, you take unnecessary risks. Um, there are times when you do things you know are evil, but you do them to keep your job or your friends or whatever it is, your status, whatever it is you desire. Sometimes 
it's because your desires are wrong. Other times you do things you know are evil because as far as you know, they're the best thing in the situation because you're in a situation where you really don't have any viable choices. And generally greed motivates the rich to use fear of losing their jobs to get the public to agree to lower wages, worse conditions. The assumption is that only the private sectors can provide good jobs this is less and less true and people are becoming more aware of it. So um, again, greed motivates a whole system of rhetoric where um, corporate leaders or economic leaders use rhetoric to manipulate workers. Other personal virtues. So for Aristotle, Self-control and courage are foundational because they're closest to our brainstem. They're what we share with the animals. They're very close to instinctual drives. It's very important in childhood to get, get the pleasures right, get the fears right, because everything else kind of emerges from that foundation. And if the foundation is bad, all the other virtues are distorted or corrupted. Um, so generosity is contributing money and time to help other people. It's natural because we all depend on each other as a matter of fact. And we should choose to recognize that dependence by helping other people. He meets, this is the word liberal. So the translation, actually the Greek word is liberality. Um, so the old fashioned view of a liberal was somebody who's generous with money specifically. I tell my students, well, you can be generous with your time. You don't have much money. You can volunteer. College students more likely to volunteer. But um, now today we'll argue about whether that money should be tax money to go to good schools and parks and help or it should be philanthropy. But either way, there should be a concerted effort to give away money or resources so you can have a strong and stable middle class. Nobody should care about anything more than that as a citizen, that's number one. It creates trust and goodwill so if you have a society where people are generous and you have a middle class, you assume other people have goodwill for you and you have goodwill for them, you trust them. But if people start pitting themselves against each other to get more money, then trust breaks down, goodwill breaks down, the social fabric breaks down, and people look for a strong man. They look for some authoritarian leader to fix their problems with them because they haven't fixed it themselves as a community. So it's really important for the community to bond together and to be generous. Um, all right. The next virtue is rational ambition. And I would call it, the word rational is very ambiguous. So you could call it wise ambition. Uh, rational ambition is not calculating the most efficient means to your self-interest, your economic self-interest or your power self-interest. It's actually uh, finding out what you can do well, that you enjoy doing, that's meaningful. It's living for the sake of something greater than yourself. It makes a contribution to the society. Once you figure out how you want to contribute in a way that's also meaningful to you, you have to work hard to get the necessary education and credentials according to how the society defines it. Now, in theory, these are natural callings. Somebody naturally wants to be a grade school teacher because they love kids. They always love kids from when they were little. Well, 
Each society makes a different demand. They demand different credentials, different sort of classes that you take. Some of those licensing projects are better than others. They're based more on research. Um, but anyway, if you want to do that, you have to get whatever credentials the society has required you to get. Then you take the job and you use your authority for the well-being of the people who over whom you have it, right? Not for wealth or power or fame. So when you're looking for a career, you look for meaning, purpose, and a social contribution so that we can have a free and open society. Rational honor is going above and beyond the demands of your job or your other social roles in order to create a high quality of life. So you should recognize people that do that, even if they don't draw attention to themselves, which they wouldn't if they care about the community. So I think every institution, I know all the schools that I've taught at, they'll have an honor day and they'll have a staff person of the year who has gone over and above the job requirement to create a healthy climate on the campus. Um, and there are student awards for things like that. And we do have a faculty award, but the faculty award does um, include a lot of scholarship professional uh, expertise. It's just the staff have expertise, but they also have a lot of leeway to, to deal with the quality of life on campus. And again, the faculty should be expected to do more of that than they usually are, but the way our institutions are set up, the uh, reward system just doesn't work that way. Another virtue is anger. Knowing how to get angry for the right reason, in the right way, toward the right person, at the right time, most of the time people get too angry or they get angry too soon or they're toward the wrong person. But there is the other extreme when you don't get angry. And if you, that happens, you tend to hold a grudge, right? So the, <clears throat> the stereotype is that depression is um, anger turned inward. And so what happens, the extremes are that um, you, you get too angry and you cause people to want to take revenge on you. You create more animosity. If you don't get angry enough and you just hold it in, but you hold a grudge, at some point you might take revenge, right? Blow everything up. There's tragedies about that. And then that makes things fall apart. So either extreme can lead to the destruction of a free and open society, a stable, flourishing society. Sociability is that you put up with minor injustices in order to maintain this flourishing society. People make mistakes all the time. They say dumb things. And if everyone complained about every mistake, every little uh, wounding of their egos, we'd all be fighting all the time. We wouldn't have any trust or goodwill and we'd lose our society. So we have to be willing to make judgments all the time about, is it worth it? Should I bring this up? Would people end up better off? So you, you just have to be thinking like a citizen. Every decision you make should be related to that. All right, so there's no separation from your development of yourself as a person and the development of other people. We become human through our relationships, which doesn't mean it's all moral relativism. Some cultures reward, set up social conditioning that is really unnatural. And over the long run, that is not going to work. So the power of social conditioning, the power of relationships is real, but there is a human nature under there.
that needs to be integrated with culture. Um, we have friendships based on utilities. Uh, and again, you can, those relationships, you can treat other people with respect as equal human beings. We have the same humanity. So you should treat the people who wait on you in certain situations as human beings, not as servants and not as beneath you in any meaningful way. Then you have relationships based on pleasure where you don't really respect the person, but they're funny. And um, when you're relaxing, okay. Um, I don't really have relationships like that because the people who give me pleasure to be around are people I respect. Um, but Aristotle does say that people do uh, go to parties, right? You're going to go to a party, you're just going to have fun, you're going to maybe drink. And that's what most people do, but it can go south pretty easily. And you have to do, you have to develop some social skills around that so that you don't end up um, really unraveling the social fabric. Everything you do, you should think about the social fabric. Then you have friendships based on virtue and you get together to do volunteer work, to create an institution, to create a higher quality of life, to um, help raise kids. I mean, there's so many things you can do that really are exercising virtue. And then if you have friends whose lives are dedicated to such activities, but when you get together with them, what you do is talk about what each other's doing and why you think that's promoting social well being. And you can give each other ideas or you can question each other and say, Are you sure you're really helping people? Or is there a better way? Just that kind of self awareness, that kind of an examined life. That's the Greek model living an examined life. The world's traditions were set up as social bonds based on exercising the virtues together. These traditions have been corrupted. So all the world's traditions, when you get together in houses of worship, those are supposed to be where people are keeping in mind God or karma, the highest good. They're working toward maintaining positive karma, creating positive karma, staying in touch with the universe, staying in touch with other people, staying in touch with yourself. All of that, there's so many rituals, temples. So temples, mosques, create this mini universe. You know, you go into this, you have a world and you use sensuality. You have hearing, music, seeing the visuals, Smelling, you have incense. Tasting, you might have in Christianity and Judaism, you have things you eat or having uh, ritual meals. Uh, touching, you have a rosary or in, in Muslim, you pray. You move your body in ways so that their sensuality is tied to spirituality. And all those traditions were designed to help uh, form people so that they take pleasure in the highest good and in bonding with each other around the understanding of higher powers and it's intergenerational it's important and we're losing it and it's not good um, we're also the west is um, ripping people apart from their traditional communities bringing them into cities to work in factories this is really perverted, which means misguided. Um, Self-knowledge, knowing what you know and what you don't know, seeking greater wisdom so you can live a better life. So there's no real gap between personal, social, and political virtues. People bring the habits they cultivated at home into their relationships. And 
they need to examine, was I well habituated? Did I think I was? And now as an adult, I realized there were some real issues there. Or do you, if you were, did grow up in a very healthy bubble, you have to realize other people did not. So you have to learn how to understand the character traits of people who were not well-raised or who do have these issues. So um, anyway, a lot of Greek tragedy is about that. So um, again, I emphasize that living moderately is the goal and generosity is the problem. So that is the end of this lecture. The main takeaways are that formation, childhood formation is important, um, but stereotypes about who's well-formed and who's not need to be re-examined. And the ultimate problem is greed. It can create the appearance of virtue and really be wicked. It can uh, educate children to use the language of virtue or to listen to the language when it's really motivated by money or power, the appearance. So we have to live self-examined lives and we have to examine each other in order to preserve a free and open society. So we're preserving both um, uh, human flourishing and also democracy. And if we don't do all of these things, we will create, make, be less stable. Whatever rulers we get will become more authoritarian. So it's a matter of degree a lot of time. It's not just the overthrow overnight, usually. So every day matters. Every decision you make matters because they all add to or subtract from the social fabric.